Hey, greetings, it's Fred in Alaska. It's a little noisy here. Um, get back away from there a little bit. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, I gotta, I'm gonna have to find a quieter place, but uh, what I'm here to share with you today uh, comes from Derek. Uh, sorry, squirrel. Uh, what Derek shared with me was from 1987 um, up the Multatna River near Jackrabbit Hills, uh, near where the confluence of the Cocktooley uh, River comes in and reaches the Multatna there. Um, I'll, uh, I'll put up a map for you guys to see right now, and I'll be back in just a minute and share what uh, him and his wife Gabby shared with me. We're... Uh, we're right here by the Little Sioux River. A little bit of trash laying around, but spring is coming, little by little. Anyway, I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, it's a bit too noisy for me to find a spot around here. Everything's melting. It's uh, <laughs> early springtime, Alaska. Yeah, I'm not trudging through any snow, I could tell you that much. Because uh, when we talk about unstable snow up here, meaning it, it looks solid, but then whoosh, you can sink right down into well, the river or you know, damn near anything. So back in 1987, um, and thanks again to Derek, uh, not not his given name but uh the one he asked me to use uh he was married to a lady named gabrielle at the time he called gabby they uh he was an independent photographer and he would sell his duck photos and various other things to uh magazines uh places like ducks unlimited and other places just waterfowl pictures they were up the Mulchatna River uh, about this time of year. The snow had just, the rivers just went out, meaning the ice just broke out. And it was a couple weeks into that when they, it, roughly this time of year, I, give or take. It it varies year to year. So <laughs> they were staying at some cabins. Um, you guys will notice it marked on the second map. Uh, not the red X, but on the, where the two rivers meet, there are some cabins there. there I, I do not believe they're there anymore. Um, not that I seen one last time I was out that way. So they had very expensive cameras. Um, he had a couple other people in the group besides him and his wife. One guy was there to film bears. Uh, they, him and his partner went off to film bears and for about four or five days they were looking for a perfect spot to set up their blinds you know some geese and other stuff were coming in they were looking for a specific species of duck that they were trying to get a photo of so there's a really really you could damn near call it a lake it is so big it's a pond in the marsh just west of those cabins you'll you notice by the red x on the topographical map uh the first map was a google earth just a more drawn out version so you could see the area and then the up close version on the topographical map second so they went through um he was armed bear spray and him and his wife gabby they went and set up these blinds near this really big small lake basically well it's all marsh so it's hard to call it a lake it, it's it's marshy as hell out there um, there's trees back by the Mulchatna River, but once you break out of that tree line, you're in the marsh. It's like walking on a waterbed, and it's not the most safe place to be, but he was adventurous. Uh, it took a lot to scare Derek. So he was confident in what he was doing. He went out, he was setting up a natural blind, using the dead grasses there and stuff, and some branches he had drug with them over the course of about three to four days. Gabby did hers the same, about eh, not quite a hundred yards away from him. So they weren't photographing each other in each other's background. Um, you got to understand, uh, from what Derek was saying, is a very, very expensive camera, uh, close to $30,000. Uh, 
it was analog it was not digital and so he had a bunch of film canisters and whatnot with him as well so what he ended up doing over the course of building the blind he was leaving small bits of supplies there and film you know just you know nitnoid things no snacks or anything like that uh, he was worried about the bears coming through and just marauding everything so <laughs> once they were set up it was about day four or five and he gets there before daylight now you got to remember land of the midnight sun it doesn't totally get dark but they came in before the birds were flying around that was his biggest concern was getting there to get these wildlife shots that they've been just aching to get done uh his first trip to alaska or no i apologize second trip first trip was lake iliamna uh like the year before uh they were photographing the the uh, resident population of sea lions there so he set up he gets there about four ish in the morning it's light out but not full-on daylight everything was still in silhouette it's broad open tundra in front of him in the marshlands nowhere for anything to really hide and if any bears around they would easily pick up on them real easily i mean they'd stick out like a sore thumb you know <laughs> so this particular morning he's sitting there and he had took a couple pictures of some snow geese that came in and it was too low a light he didn't like what was going on with you know trying to get his focus and filters and all that with the lenses so he decided to wait a little bit and since he was damn near out of film on that one he pops it open to change out the film while he's doing so he hears a weird kind of gurgly snort kind of sound like uh similar to the sea lions he heard blowing water out when they came above water so he kind of thought it was weird he kind of peeked up above his blind didn't really notice anything initially was sitting there and fumbling with the stuff and here's this low gurgling kind of a growling sound very very similar to the sea lions but not quite it was it, he said it sounded a lot deeper so that really caught his attention like what the hell is a fucking sea lion doing in this pond so it got his attention so he stops what he's doing he, he gets up sits up higher to look over the blind and he sees something brown moving around in the water and he's like that looks like a is that a beaver and and so he's he's trying to figure out what he's seeing and then he's like eh, it goes back to what he's doing he, he figures he gets some film in the camera and take a picture of a beaver maybe or maybe there is a sea lion he didn't know you know he was just trying to figure out well, that's weird because it didn't come from anywhere it just showed up in the water so as he's doing so he noticed he hears splashing of the water real close to the edge where his blind was now where he had ended up setting up his blind he had kind of made this half moon shaped path back and forth where he initially wanted a blind but it was too marshy everything was sinking down so he had walking back and forth moving the initial blind to where he ended up being um, he had a probably a two and a half three foot wide little trailway through the marsh because going back and forth it would draw up the groundwater and it would be on top so you know he was going right next to his old tracks just walking back and forth and it was about two and a half three foot wide so and the rest was dried grass so on so as he's hearing this water gurgling sound the reason i point out that path forgive me it, it, it becomes evident here in a few minutes so he he leans up a little higher when he hears a water trickling sound and another grunt and kind of noise so he gets up from what he's doing he still hasn't put the film in the camera yet and he's kind of looking up higher doesn't notice anything and then he stands up fully to look over because he was pretty close to the water's edge and when he did so he noticed this thing staring at him uh he said it was like a buckskin colored skin tone black looking eyes really dark hair all flushed down from the water of course uh he said he didn't notice any ears but he made eye contact with this thing for about he said it felt like a million years but it was probably just seconds as he's doing so he's he's basically in shock what what the hell am i looking at and this thing stands up exposing more of its body and raises a hand out of the water and puts it up on the edge of this pond now he 
is damn near having a heart attack at this point because where it set his hand is less than five feet from him. This thing is literally just on the other side of his blind. Uh, he said if he had a standard size house broom, he could have reached out with the house broom and poked this thing in the chest. That's how far away it was. Uh, he said standing up in the water, it uh, came about mid-rip just below the chest of what he could see in the one arm before he collapsed down behind the blind, shaking real hard, trying to hurry up and get the film into the camera. As he's doing so, this guttural growl just reverberates through his little area, freaking him the hell out. He felt pinned in. Uh, he, he said he was overwhelmed with, uh, with fear. Uh, an unnatural fear. He he almost couldn't move. He was he wanted to call out to Gabby to run because she wasn't she was less than 100 yards away off to his right hand side just around the rim of this pond. Um, her blind was set up similarly to his, and she didn't know what was going on at the moment. Now, as he's freaking out. He, he's so shaken he can't do anything with his camera. He stops what he's doing and he starts backing up a little ways. This thing lets out a growl whenever he moved. It would growl and growl some more. Uh, he said he felt like it was he was being challenged. And it was really hard to overcome the fear he was dealing with. Uh, he said he took one of his waterproof matches as he was sitting there and tried to light the grass on fire. He said it, it caught a little bit, caught a little bit of his blind on fire as well, but it was uh, a distraction in his mind. As soon as that little fire was going a little bit, he he just jumps up and imagine trying to run across a waterbed. Uh, he fell several times and it dawned on him, I'm fleeing and Gabby doesn't know what's going on. So he stops about half the distance back to the trees and starts screaming for Gabby, Gabby, Gabby. Well, she heard him. He, she turns to look to see what was going on, sees this thing inspecting his blind area. She turns, sees Derek, and commences to beelining it towards him. She hadn't even gotten her camera out of the bag. Um, she had a just as inexpensive of a camera, but she carried hers in this waterproof bag that, that floated and whatnot. But anyway, so she flees her area and meets up with Derek. Um, they... They get the hell out of Dodge. They make it back to the cabin and they, they're they stuck with their own thoughts of what the hell. Because Gabby didn't see it as close as Derek did. Derek was shaken up. Um, when he fled, he left the gun. He left the bear spray, his camera. Uh, basically, he just up and left. <laughs> Gabby, the same thing. Now... He gets, they get back to the cabin and, and they calm down. The other two with them at this particular cabin that went on the other side of Jackrabbit Hills to film for bears going through, they were not back. They did not make it back that night. They were very fearful of their well-being because of what was going on. Now, during that night, they kept hearing this bellowing, roaring kind of scream sound coming from that direction that they were at. And at this point, they're, gosh, a little over half a mile away from the area where they were going to be, you know, doing their photography. So it, it was very loud, especially to reverberate through the trees and for them to hear it from that distance. Very, very loud. So panic stricken, they no gun, nothing there. Um, as far as, you know, their bear spray and gun were left at his blind. So... And of course, you know, when you get in a panic, it, it's up for a lot of people. It didn't matter if they're holding a gun. It, they, because of the shock of the realization of what's going on, it irrelevant. It, even a camera in the hand probably wouldn't have made a difference. But so they're listening to this screaming, bellowing sound. Uh, Gabby's freaked out. She's concerned because they got a lot of money invested in these cameras. Like I said, his was damn near $30,000 for all the bells and whistles and stuff. And same for her. So they're looking at a huge chunk of change that's left out in the wild. Uh, his was on a small tripod. The back was open. You know, and not not you don't want your camera back open in those conditions, moisture and stuff. So they're really concerned about their gear. But they're they're trying to convince themselves of what he saw. She saw this thing 
at a distance and couldn't really make out the features that Derek had seen. So he was trying to fill her in on a little, you know, it, this looked like a Bigfoot, he tells her. And so she she didn't know what to do with that. She asked him, where'd it come from? He goes, it just showed up. It was in the water. It made a noise. I thought it was a sea lion. And that thing was there. So guesstimation and only speculation, he felt it came out of the water. I don't know. That he didn't he didn't see it come to the pond it, or whatever. It just it was there all of a sudden. Next morning, uh, they were able to sleep a little bit. It was it was broken sleep. They woke up to the, a thumping sound coming up the stairs of the cabin, so they freak out. Uh, they scurry to the back side of it, and it was the other two that went out to film for bear. Um, they were having problems with their cameras. Uh, things, uh, something had happened, and it, it wasn't functioning right. They had another camera, and the one guy was trying to get it going, and they spill all the stuff onto these two guys that just came in the door. Hey, there was a Bigfoot, blah, 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 blah. They didn't take them serious at first. Uh, they blew them off. They're like, oh, come on, man. The, you know, Moose is probably a bear. And he goes, no, no, we left our cameras there. And then they took it serious because they knew the value of those cameras. And no one's just going to leave something that expensive just willy-nilly for no reason. You know what I mean? And uh, plus the fact he had a gun and left that. To flee the scene right told him about setting the fire and he goes well we didn't see any smoke so it must not have caught he, he explained to him it, it caught right near my blind caught part of the blind and i was gone so they have a discussion and the one guy was like still the initial guy they were talking to believed them because of those things because of the expensive cameras and all that and how freaked out they were the other guy that was with them didn't really buy into it he was like, ah, you guys are just over paranoid about some bears. Maybe we should be filming over there for the bear since it obviously is over there. And it just real dismissive of him. And the guy says, well, let's go, let's go get your stuff. You know, I'll go with you. I have my gun. We'll go. We'll retrieve your stuff. You can get the gun. You can get your cameras. And the guy, the other guy said, I'm going to stay here and get this camera operational while you run a wild goose chase. Because he was dismissive of the whole thing. And so they they go back across they get back up into the area they cut out that you can easily Derek said you could easily see every path he had made out to this pond same with where Gabby branched off from his path and went and made her blind so they get to that point to the blind and his camera looked like it had been toppled over and pushed into the tundra into the marsh so uh, it was basically flush with the marsh tundra. The back was still open. Like he, he was devastated by the loss of his camera. The, the blind was just kind of pushed down or whatever. The fire didn't make it very far. He said the fire patch was maybe two foot in a circle. It, everything was too wet to really burn. Ah, uh, collected up the gun. The gun was untouched. Uh, the other bag he had all his film rolls in was untouched, but the camera was forced down and the blind was basically knocked down. They looked around for treks, but it was marsh. Uh, they saw deeper depressions following his little trail from where his first blind was, but then they disappeared. They get over to Gabby's spot where she was. Her bag is gone. N no sign of it. Her blind wasn't knocked down, but her bag was gone. Um... They were, Gabby and Derek were shaking like leaves on a tree. They kept looking at the pond, looking around, you know, trying to see if they could see this thing in the water moving around, you know, like he initially did thinking it was a beaver. The, the videographer that was with them had told them, hey, I've heard stories coming out here a few different times from some of the locals, especially down, uh, Quijack River and near Naknik and stuff and over in Iliamna about the hairy man and we should not we, we should just cut our losses and get back to the cabin they he gathered what he could the, the gun and his excess stuff but her stuff was gone and they get back to the cabin um, he said the thing that stood out the most was the grumble when it when it growled because he was on that marsh he felt it 
Imagine sitting on a waterbed and the waterbed vibrates with a sound you hear along with your clothes. He said it was intense how the vibration, he said it almost made him feel like it, it was almost paralyzing him and that was one of the things that really freaked him out. He said during the moment the gun didn't cross his mind. Uh, any of that other stuff that you would think, oh hey, you know, grab the gun, shoot it, stuff like that. It meant nothing. It was terror. Uh, he said he... It was an unnecessary fear because this thing wasn't necessarily aggressive. Uh, he said whatever it was, the feeling he got felt like it was unnatural. So I, I want to thank Derek for sharing that. Because when, when they got back to the cabin and the guy told them you know, the other videographer and stuff, hey, this is what, what I saw and this and that, the guy was still dismissive, and there's going to be people like that all over, it, it's irrelevant, but uh, I want to thank Derek for sharing that, again, that happened in 1987 up the Mulchatna River near where it, uh, the Cocktooley River meets it, you, you, you can see it on the map, if not rewind, and it's the second map, uh, the topographical, you can see where the X was marked, uh, rough guesstimation on his part uh we're going back to 1987 but i want to thank derek again um and let's see what else was there uh that that was it all right i want to thank you guys for joining me today in beautiful alaska i'm hoping the the snow clears out soon and we can get to some better places but until then we'll catch you on the next one